do some really meaningful, powerful stuff if we all interact. If not, I'm going to talk about every high school match I ever played and why I won and lost all those matches. I have it in my bag, so I can do that. Anyway, let's go through. Um, I'm going to kind of review why educating parents is so important, and we'll go through some tips to kind of help you. We'll have some fun with it, too. So, Okay, Link, I'll give you the signal. Is that what we'll yep, do? Yep, just do it. All right, we'll go for it. We'll just get through a couple quick. Uh-oh. Maybe it went to sleep. There it is. <laughs> These parents are Southern, uh, Southern California, of course, the Williams sisters and Brian brothers. Wayne had his kids playing in tournaments at the age of six. Interesting for me, but, but they all had a plan. Mm -hmm. That's okay, we can go right here. We'll go right for it. Um, I want to make sure that we understand this with personality profiling. You do have to get an understanding of the, of the parent's personality as well. And this is a, a father of one of my students Amir Sadeghi, this is before the match. Okay, so <laughs> you can tell he's a little bit high strung, type A kind of a guy. Um, but their personality will definitely impact the player's attitude and outlook and happiness and health and weight, well being, and obviously the length of time in the game. So we're going to take a minute and look at some, some basic ones that we see at every club. And let me know if you see these parental personalities as well. All right, so we'll, let's go to the first. You guys have jabber jaws. These are the, the parents, they come to the one hour lesson, they talk for 45 minutes, and they banter about how crummy their kid is during the tournament. And then on the way out, you hear them saying, you know, we really didn't get a lot out of that lesson. It wasn't very productive. They monopolize the whole hour. You get 10 minutes to teach, maybe, and then you pick up balls. So I think it's really important that if we have these jabber jaws, the solution for this type is ask them to provide insight via email the night before. They're not allowed to pr provide all their insight during the child's lesson because they're wasting their time, they're wasting their money. Get it? Okay, let's go to the next one. We'll bang through it. Judgers. Remember we talked about brain function before and channel capacity a little bit. But sometimes personality profiles that are judgers, they'll, these parents will come to your lesson. And like we said before, you're working on the serve, and they are put got their hands to the fence. They're talking about, what about the knee bend? You know, the, person, the kid's head's dropping. And they really think they're helping by spotting 47 things the kid's doing wrong in the one-hour lesson. And, and, but they're not really helping. So I think it's really important to explain that. Hey, remember when you guys back there talked about you didn't let your wife come to your kids' lessons? What, are you a judger or a perceiver? Judge. Yeah. We have to get you a pair of those glasses. <laughs> No, just kidding. Okay, what's the next one? Ex-athletes. Ex-athletes usually are the kind of parents that are still trying to teach what they did back in their day. So if they served in ball or if they had a continental grip or whatever, they're trying to teach their, their systems a little bit. Um, here's how you can spot ex-athletes. Even on the phone. When they talk about tennis, they say things like, we're ranked 20. We play at two. Um, and, and, but when the kid loses, get what they say. They go, she didn't listen to me. <laughs> she, she lost. They didn't lose, but it's always weak. But um, yeah, you want to spot these. This is Ravi Patel, rocket scientist. He'll be talking about um, interesting things to his daughter, though. He's talking about incident reflected angles. So taking a cross-court ball and why the angle of the racket, if it's a vertical racket face, the ball's coming in, turns on, goes in the alley. He's explaining incident reflected angles. He's talking about opposing force vectors on the serve. And I'm saying, Robbie, this is great, but your daughter's six. <laughs> Vince is only six, so you're talking a little over her head. So we get, there's a lot of rocket science type of parents that want to impart their knowledge. But again, remember, we've got to get into their world. We've got to get the parents to get into their world. That's a recurring theme. OK, Robbie, bye. Drill sergeants. Are there any drill sergeant coach, coaches here? What's the, what's the biggest um, claim to fame? What's their, uh, what's their battle cry? Drill sergeants. Do it because That's I said so. so. See, to me, drill sergeants are the kind of coaches that don't really have knowledge. They just have fear factor. But it doesn't really work in the, in the long haul. Um, it's, if, you, if you spot these parents that are drill sergeants, I think it's important to bring them aside and have them understand that there are some personality profiles that like that approach. 
But most kids don't thrive nowadays on do it because I said so. It doesn't work anymore because remember kids nowadays walk around with these little computers. They Google everything. They're so smart, these kids. Do it because I said so is not valid anymore. So, all right, so another, I think there's any more, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, the Negatron. Or I had a mom, I called this mom Crabzilla, and she got so mad. You know Crabzilla? But I'm trying to play this flip it game. Does anybody have negative tennis parents out there? Here, here's the flip it game, it's really fun. Ask the parents to do this. The child, the parents, the coach, anybody's allowed to say flip it whenever somebody says something pessimistic <coughs> or negative. So let's try it. Pretend you guys are the parents. Give me some of the negative things you'll, you'll hear, like the day of a match maybe. Any, any, any examples? You didn't do anything that you did the day before. All right. All right, cool. So we would say flip it, find some of the positive things that she did well. That's right. What else? What are some other things we hear often from parents? Too slow on the court. Yeah, she's too slow on the court. Um, we want to flip it to things like her footwork is actually fast, but it's her cognitive processing speed. She's over-processing. She, I find this a lot, by the way. They overanalyze because it's based on fear, because they fear that, that their parents are going to belittle them later. So their, their lack of speed is not foot speed, it's hesitation, and it's due to cognitive processing speed. So if you have players that are, good example, but if you have players that seem to be a little bit slow on the court, I'll give you a good drill to work on. It's called broad vision, narrow vision. When the ball is coming into the player, so you're the player, here comes the ball, ask them to do narrow vision where they're tracking the ball, they watch it bounce, they watch it come up, and they watch it come into their strike zone narrow. But as soon as the ball leaves their racket, it's headed to the other side, ask them to shift to broad vision, pick up the whole picture. That means, guess what? They don't watch the ball all the time. That's a myth. It's, it's a myth that you're supposed to watch the ball the whole time. Federer does not. When the ball leaves Federer's racket, what are some of the things that he's picking up? What do you think? Why is he so quick? He's going to spot the opponent's well, first he spots where his ball's in the land, right? The court zone. He's spotting the opponent's strike zone. Are they hitting balls down by their socks? Uncoiling the kinetic chain waist level? Are they falling back on a high ball? What does that tell you as a, a good competitor? You can anticipate that. You can, yeah. If they're on defense, you're on offense. If they're on offense, you're on defense. You can have them in broad vision, you can have them pick up things like swing speed, swing length. Like what does this swing tell you compared to this swing? A 12 foot loop is going to be crushing the ball, right? And a little slice swing, they're going to drop shot or take pace off the ball probably. You need to teach that. That's kind of big stuff for us as coaches if we want to develop high level players. So anyway. <laughs> These, Uneducated tennis parents, not only will they sabotage their kids' success, but your program's success. Because guess what? One parent that's disgruntled and they don't like what you're doing, they're going to tell 100. It's like poison. I mean, you got to really make sure that the tennis parents are your best friends. Because they're your sales and marketing force for your program. If you're great, they're going to they're gonna tell, especially, I, this is interesting, the, the, the intermediate level, they're going to tell everybody. At the higher level of junior tennis, the parents are so competitive, they're going to go, this guy is great. We're not telling anybody. So they won't, at the higher level, they won't share. But, all right, let's keep going a little bit more. Come on. Top 20 tennis parent blunders. Can we bang through that a little bit? Yeah. And I bet you guys have seen it all before, but we'll, we'll have some fun with it. The first one is, we talked about it, ignoring your child's brain and body type. So. We got into that a little bit earlier, so we'll go right to the next one. Encouraging uh, dependency. Parents, and even sometimes coaches, if they're encouraging, you're only going to be great if you stick to me. I don't want to ever catch you taking a lesson with anybody else. I'm your savior. And, and, and to me, that's bad. Um, here's a great little game if you feel like you have the like, helicopter parents out there. It, do you guys ever hear the term now called bulldozer parents? These are the parents you can, you, can, you can imagine, but they're going to 
bulldoze everybody in the way of their child's success, but that's a new name nowadays. But um, Here's what I did though with my daughter when, when she was 10, 11, 12. It's called the autopilot or co-pilot game. Whenever we went to a tournament, for example, she had to find the airport, she had to find parking, she had to find um, the American Airlines, she had to find the gate, she had to find our seat. When we get off the plane, she had to find baggage claim. She's 10. She had to find the rental car. And I go, look, I'm with you for the whole trip. But you gotta, you're gotta, you going to be the, you're the autopilot. She had to find the hotel, find the practice course. But guess what that developed? Problem solving skills. And if you're going to win in tennis, you got to be resilient, right? Persevere, solve your own problems kind of thing. And by, I think she was playing junior Fed Cup by... 14, so she was traveling to Germany and England by herself. And for a 13-year-old, that's scary, unless you've done this kind of stuff. So she was with a team, but she didn't have you know, parents with her. So make sure that you're in that. Number, all right, number, that's okay, number three, you can go for it. Everybody's heard of this nowadays, right? 10,000 hour rule. It was first used in, it was like, I think 1870s was the, the first time they used that. So it's, it's not new, but, Definitely, though, it's not, it's not an exact number because quality trumps quantity, right? So we, we, that's really big. I'd rather have a player training eight hours a week of quality than 20 hours a week of just mindless rallying back and forth. So that's important. But yeah, all these, all these greats, if you do research, you'll see that they all did, did about 10,000 hours if they want to be taught, you know? All right, so another blunder. Let's go through this idea about changing, changing motor programs. Um, I had this discussion last night, but great example. I had a player that started training with me, and after about three months, they qualified for the Clay Court Super Nationals. There's no clay courts really around California too much. So they go to uh, St. Louis to play a clay court tournament before the, the Supers in Florida. Well, what happened, this is periodization also, but what happened was, the parent thought they were really doing a great job by booking some lessons for the kid on clay. Well, this is a day or so before you know, the clay court tournament. The local pro changed the player's serve grip the day before the tournament. So now the child didn't have his old serve anymore, didn't have the new stroke yet, loses first and first, goes to the clay courts, loses first and first, horrible experience, bad periodization, parental sabotage, because they didn't know any better. You get it? Um, let's kind of review this. This is from my old Vic Brain tennis college days. It takes four to six weeks to change an old motor program. Four to six because it depends on how many hours a day and how, in, how intently they're focusing. So bottom line is in the first week, you might have a student and they're 100% doing it the old way and it's a little bit flawed, 0% new. By the second week, 70% still old, 30% new. By the third week, you're about 50-50. Now it's getting kind of it's getting kind of fun. By the fourth week, now it flips. Now it's 70%. The new motor program is locking in, but the old motor program doesn't want to die, right? And, and be careful. Don't use the term muscle memory anymore, because kids know muscle um, muscle is not where you store memory. You don't store memory in your muscles. It's an electrical signal you send from your brain to the nervous system through the motor programs. So if you say muscle memory to a kid, they'll go, stupid. They didn't know that's not, that's old fashioned stuff. So by the, by the fifth week, you're like 80, 90% new, 10, 20%. By the sixth week, you've overridden the old program. But a lot of parents do this. After three weeks of lessons, they're at about 50, 50, three weeks in, the parent puts them into a tournament because they can't stand it if little Martha down the street gets ahead of their daughter. And now by the third week, what happens? The child plays a tournament. They don't have the old anymore. They don't have the new yet. So they go back to the old flawed stroke. And now the parent just wasted all their time and money and all your time and energy because now the kid is all the way back to their old. So that's a, an interesting common blunder though, okay? All right. Lane. Yes, sir. Sorry. Last time I did one of these, he was watching the football game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. 
<laughs> but it was like Oklahoma or something. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. 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 So I didn't just waste the time. It, no. Yeah. It was valuable. What's your, uh, can you address number four again? What's your uh, recommendation when you do have, let's say, again, many places around the nation, private coach, and then maybe for the player, and they hit a lot of balls, and the kids, et cetera, at the academy there, so you make, you got to work obviously with the coach, or how maybe you won't be long that coach. Well, well, you're just talking about tennis parent education that they have to inform all the coaches that she's making changes in her stroke mechanics. She's not focusing on winning right now, but we want her to. If she is going to play competitive points, even a little bit, she's going to try to use her new mechanics, which is still a bad idea. They're, nobody competitive is going to do that, right? They're going to say, "Well, I know, I kind of know what Frank says. I'll start that next week because I'm not losing to Joey." And they'll go back to their old stuff all the time. So if, if you have a, a serious player, um, it's probably in their best interest not to play for at least three, four, five weeks, not to be in a competitive tournament. Um, but, but suss it out, because everybody's different. I've had players in three weeks get the new motor program. Uh, but it depends on how many hours a day they're working on it. If you have a player that's capable of doing four hours a day on a slice backhand, they can get it fast. They can fix stuff. So. Frank, at the, end of a, at the end of a season, when you set up the periodization for the next year, yeah. so at the end of that season, you determined that this player had a severe weakness in one place. Is, is, is it still a four- to six-week process, or would you start it early in the year, maybe get away from it you know, during the off months with some specific training, physical training, and then bring it back? Is it something you would introduce early, go away from it, and then bring it back as you get closer I, to playing? I think I would go away from it, and then I would just suss out, though, with how much trauma the, the player is suffering in matches and how eager they are to get back to it. If they're the kind of kid that they're so burnt out, they need two weeks away from rackets, then I would definitely wait and kind of get them in shape first. Um, some kids, though, that, you know, they're... They have more energy. They, they're losing first, second round. They're not making it to the finals every week. So they might have more energy to start a little bit earlier. So I guess the answer to me would be we have to customize that kind of stuff. So if it's a situation like you're trying to teach a, let's say you're trying to teach a 10, 12-year-old to hit a, a, you know, a top spin serve or slice, something really yeah. fairly complicated for their skill set. Yeah. You, know, you introduce it, you take a look at it, and you go, mm, they may not be ready to do this. You go away from it, and, you, and then maybe you don't bring it back until they're maybe a year older. Oh, okay, good point. Something like so everybody that. Everybody get Lane's point. It's based on their growth development schedule, their maturity level, when you introduce things. And I think that's customized, though, too. I think that's important. There's, to me, there's, I see eight-year-olds that are more mature than 17-year-olds, and then 17-year-olds that are more immature than 10-year-olds. So I don't think there's a... A straight answer to it. For me, I would just be flexible. Yeah, when I work with plyometrics with 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 players, for example, you know the, the rule of thumb that we use is they have to be physically and mentally capable mm -hmm. of of understanding and executing yeah. the exercises. So if you take a 11, 12 year old and try to teach them how to hit a top spin serve, and they're completely inept at it, yeah, you know, then it's maybe a situation where you wait a year. Yeah. You know, and, and those are valu that's valuable time is the only reason I kind of bring it up. Mm -hmm. Because when you get back to the parent's view of this, and you, you explain to them that your child is not physically able to execute this. Yeah. And so if I put her in a, or him in a play situation, in a, in a high level competitive situation, they're going to get murdered. They're going to get frustrated. They're going to get angry. Yeah. And then it snowballs into this thing. Yeah. So it, I guess it has to be very strategically placed in that periodization program. I, I believe so. Then that's part of my intuitive, my intuitive brain type would be to wait and suss it out. Um, I, my gut instinct usually is talk to the children a lot, understand their tennis IQ, you know that type of thing. Because some kids really can understand a lot more than we think. But some, you got you guys know you have some kids that come at, at age age twelve. They're happy just because they have the Nike dress. They're satisfied. They got the dress. Other 12-year-olds walk on the court, and they're pretty sure they're going to beat the club pro two and two. And it's a 12-year-old. So they're just so different all the time. So, yeah, customize it. That's what this is all about, really. So, Okay. Um, on your 
right next to Bobby and King um, after winning the U.S. Open. But interesting story. She was my daughter's doubles partner growing up. Great player. I just saw her a week or so ago. Um, great player. She's the kind of gal, though, that in junior, she wasn't winning national titles. So she went to the ITF level five and fours in Indonesia, Bangkok. She won a couple ITFs. She learned how to compete five matches in a row. She won tournaments. She came home. The ITF gave her wild cards. Her confidence just blossomed like crazy. She got wild carded into a couple of major league tournaments. She gets a wild card now into the U.S. Open. She wins two rounds. In the, this is 2005. She wins two rounds in the Open. And she's ranked top 50 in the world six months later. Six, mo six months before, she wasn't getting past the quarters in national tournaments. So she actually played down to pump herself up. So that's an interesting take, because a lot of parents they go, I'm going to put my kid up in the 18s when they're 12. Yeah. And maybe the opposite might work. OK, another blunder. Did anybody recognize that guy? Remember old school? Yeah. Who is it? Cent uh, Centauri for Beast? Yeah. 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 Interesting quote. I've, I've yet to have one player win a national tournament that had perfect strokes on everything. So don't worry about if every stroke is perfect. It's all about putting together your top seven patterns. Um, how well do you hide your deficiencies, expose your efficiencies? That's important when you're coaching. Um, I think it's a blunder even for coaches to say, well, they're not perfect yet. They're not, we don't want them to play until they're perfect. They're not going to be perfect. Okay, next blunder, common blunders. Does anybody recognize this guy? It's not, it's not a tennis guy. But very interesting. If you Google this guy, really interesting. Chris Langan, the highest IQ ever reported, smartest man in the world. And he was a, a, bar, a bartender bouncer, and now he's feeding horses in Minnesota because he doesn't have great life skills. He wasn't nurtured life skills from his parents. So while he's off the charts brilliant, he can't negotiate relationships. So we want to make sure that a great blunder is when, when you're training the families, have them go say thank you to every tournament director, have them thank the line, line to people, have them thank the coach after every lesson. We want to teach life skills because that's how they're going to get ahead in the world anyway. All these little things we're teaching on the tennis court are going to actually help them later on in life, right? You've heard it a million times. OK, let's go to the next one. Did anybody here have their parents chart matches and then bring back charting information, maybe on a phone app or on paper? Anybody do charting yet? All right, cool. If anybody wants, I have a, a different little ebook. It's 10 very different ways to chart. It's really simple. Any, any parent can do it. Um, if you want that, I'll send it to you for free. Don't worry. Just email me. I'll, I'll send it to you. Top 10 ways to chart. Um, my favorite is this called cause of error chart. So if you want to write something important down, write this down. It's not just what stroke is making the error. It's the cause of error. So most charts, like even an iPhone app, it'll tell you Little Jenny made 28 backhand errors, six forehand errors. But let's go deeper. What's the cause of error? So here's the cause of error chart. Is it poor movement and spacing? That's one. Reckless shot selection. That's two. Poor emotions or poor focus control. That could cause errors. That's three. And the last one, number four, is technique. Poor technique, poor form, right? Um, what you'll see, it's really interesting though, you'll see this, you get parents, they'll, especially if they, have, if they have a little bit of tennis knowledge, they'll be okay doing this stuff. What I find is almost always at higher level juniors, reckless shot selection is the primary number one cause of errors in matches, followed by bad movement and spacing around the court, that caused errors. And then emotional control and, and last is just form. But guess what most coaches do? The kid loses, the parents say, my kid lost, she missed too many backhands, and then the, 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 the coach comes out and feeds balls right to their backhand, and they don't work on shot selection, and they don't work on movement and spacing, they're working on technical, and that's not even the cause of the error. 
You get it? So we're going to go a little bit, go a little bit deeper. That's what these different, different charts will do. Okay. Number nine. This is one of my weekend workshops. We, we kind of do this with all the players back in California. It seems to be pretty fun. They're, they're getting a kick out of it. They're, I think they actually are maximizing potential at a faster rate. Um, do you guys do match logs? Do you have your players do match logs? At the end of every match where they're self-grading their performance? Um, the higher level players do that. But I can send that stuff to you too if anybody wants that later. But this is big. We're doing it right now. We're doing our customized you know, evaluation package. You guys are doing this right now. So take some time, do that with your families. It might prove to be meaningful. Okay, what's our next one? And we're winding down. In California, we get a lot of a lot of kids that are actors and actresses. Did anybody watch the Big Bang Theory? Did Kelly Coco, the blonde, she was a nationally ranked tennis player. Yeah. And she had to when she got that role, she had to choose tennis or, or acting. But here's this, it's really similar, but check this out. See it's receiving a script. They get a job as an actor or an actress. Our script in tennis might be when the junior player or parent says to us, as coaches, they go, my child cannot beat a moon ball pusher. So we're going to write down all the, all the patterns and, and, and plays. All right, and, and the Hollywood actress, they're going to do a table read. We go into court and we just run those patterns over and over and over. And a good example uh, from my side, if your child or your athlete has emotional issues or focus issues, do negative scoring with every drill. So let's say the drill is hit a high loopy backhand, fence the other girl back, she'll throw up a moon ball, come in, come in, come in, do a swing volley. Okay, that's a two ball drill, moon ball approach, swing volley. If she does it correctly, she gets a point all the way up to 10. Now, but if she does it wrong, if she makes an unforced error, minus one to the score. Okay, this is critical. It's like a stress buster drill. Always do negative scoring. Because you'll see, it's funny, they get to nine, they lose focus, they go back to five. They get up to seven or eight, they lose focus, they go back down to four. And it's really difficult to get to ten. So try to add negative scoring to your drills. It'll help a little bit. Dress rehearsal is like playing matches, right? And we said maybe hire a, an older player to play sets against. Tell the older player to role model and be the most annoying pusher ever. That's important. And the last thing is play a real tournament that they shoot the show on, on Friday. They shoot their TV shows in California. But, but I got to tell you, most of the time, as coaches, we, we fail too. We don't do this. The kid comes back and the parents say, you know, we, they lost to another moonball pusher. We go, yeah, okay, got it. Then they come back, we put them in the clinic, and they rally cross court hard to each other. So we don't design the patterns to beat pushers. We don't groove the patterns. We don't make sure they do practice sense. And I guess who they lose to again the next week. Pushers, because it's up to us. We gotta, we gotta be smarter than, we gotta like be in charge of the entourage a little bit. All right, you okay for that? Is this stuff meaningful to you guys? It's, you guys are a quiet group, I know it's early, but you're right. So many times I hear parents call me and go, my kid choked. My kid's such a choke, they always choke. But remember, there's, there's two different like, performance, performance anxieties, choking and panicking. So they're opposite. So choking is overthinking, panicking is underthinking. Overthinking is when the kid is up 5'2", and now they're thinking about the future, right? And when they're thinking about future thoughts, it's pretty hard to stay in your performance goal, and you start to kind of freak out and panic and fall apart. But uh, try to understand, you've, have you guys all seen the panicking look on, on juniors? Where they walk fast and faster, and they don't do between point rituals. They're like a deer in the headlight look in their eyes. Um, that's, that's a little different. That's underthinking. They're not even taking the time, right? So in the books, we talk a little bit more about things like sports psychology, under arousal versus over arousal, versus the ideal performance state of mind they should be in. And, and players have to understand what part of the brain they're in. Over arousal, under, and then there's all these like, it's weird, but there's triggers. There's actually physical triggers and verbal triggers that they can use for solutions to pull them back. So in panicking, there's, 
What would you guys do if you were, if your kid is panicking out there? They're not thinking at all. They're overhitting. They're blasting balls out. They're overplaying. They're walking too fast. What would be a verbal trigger that you would use to help calm them down? Slow down. Slow down. Take your take take more time, right? What else? What's what's a more calming verbal? Breathe. 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 Yeah. About to breathe. Yeah. How about instead of verbal? How about physical triggers? What do you want them to do with their? Court position or body or time management. Calm, calm down. Calm, calm it down for sure, right? Walk to the back fence, use your full 25 seconds, go to your towel, maybe might be a, a physical trigger. How about the other side? How about if it's a, how about if you're kind of choking more and you're, um, you're kind of in this under arousal where you're, your body is so t tight you can't even play anymore. We've seen it with pros, right? They get really tight. Um, how would you how would you give them triggers to loosen up and relax? So instead of calm down and relax, we want we want them to actually um, loosen up their body more because they're too tight. You know, they're, they're doing this in between. What would be a trigger? Can anybody give me like a verbal trigger or even a physical trigger? Just hit it. Okay, just hit it. Relax. Relax. Right. Stay loose. Hit through the ball. Sometimes they're gripping the racket so tight, you take it, get them to take a racket and they're Yeah, take it out of the dominant hand. That's good. I think it's good. Don't stop overthinking. Yeah, stop overthinking. It's, you know, it's over-processing for sure, right? It's weird they do all these neuro neurological studies with sports now, and they show people that are overthinking, their, their brain is like lit up like fireworks. And the players that are in the zone playing just cool and calm, their brain is quiet. There's no, there's no lights going off. And the panicking players, is, they're overthinking like that, you're right. Uh, how about go back, do some swishes? You ever see pros like Sharapova does it, right? So take some swishes to relax the muscles. So anyway, that's that's part of this. So Frank, just to be clear, mm -hmm. between choking and panicking, okay, you have a player that's up a set in five two, and all of a sudden the match is getting away from them. Okay, yeah. it's getting five three, five four. Are they at this point choking or panicking? They've got cement elbow. It, it, nothing works. I think it Which depends. Which one is it? So the, the question is, are they choking or panicking? Well, it depends on personality, too, because you've got, you've, got, you've got somebody, like, I was notorious for, well, I would, the match wasn't done, but I was already figuring out who I was playing the next round, and now it's five ball. And so then, perceiver, right? Yeah. So yeah. now, now I'm, I'm, I'm worried about, more about how did I get to this position than I am actually worrying about what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah, right on. So a good point. It's what's going on inside your head, the cognitive processing. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I, I think choking people, more often than not, choking people are over, overthinking. They have too much, too many con contaminants in their brain. All these irrelevant thoughts that have nothing to do with winning the match are bouncing around their brain. And you've got to quiet them down to just performance goals. Like, okay, just surge in the back end. And just hit high and heavy, and when you get a short ball, go up the line or attack the back end or whatever. And you got to kind of dummy up a little bit when you're. Wouldn't you say that most most kids have a, a particular pattern they like, and wouldn't you want them to go back to whatever their go-to pattern is? I think so. It's all about the rituals, right? That's the get them back in more instead of worrying about which pattern to use. Get them to the one they like. Yeah, that's customizing it too, right? Yeah. I think that's right on. He's talking about customizing their rituals, and but I think it's it's the point too, and that Lane's making too, is that they have to know if they're choking or panicking. Because if you're panicking and freaking out and not thinking at all, you're like, okay, screw it, I don't care anymore. That's a different head state, right, than a guy that's thinking about where the trophy's gonna go and all that stuff, so. Anyway, so it's fun stuff for sure. All right, let's keep going, because we have a couple more. Not seeing stumbling blocks and stepping stones. I'll give you a quick story with this. Molly Scott, who played number one at Dartmouth all four years, um, she was training with me and she calls me and she goes, I was running on the track like you said, and I fell and I sprained my ankle, or so I sprained my wrist, I can't play for six weeks. So we go, God, sorry, I'm sorry for making you run. You know. <laughs> but you know, that's unfortunate, but this is great. We can work on, we can work on your slice backhand, your drop shot, your low backhand volleys. And she's like, oh. So anyway, we changed her whole program. She works on slice. About a month later, she plays a national. She beats the number one player in the country by hitting drop shots. And she didn't even have a drop shot. 
until she fell and, and sprained her wrist. So when you have parents that say, you know, my kid can't play, they, they twisted their ankle, you can work an upper body. You can put them in a little chair and do med ball. You can always find something to do to, to maximize their potential, okay? Okay. We talked about this before, about my opinion of the school methodology. Try to make sure all your players are doing, are doing this if they want to be high performance players. They're not just doing primary strokes all day, every day. We want them to be well developed, not like Chris Lang, remember the guy, the smartest guy in the world that's feeding horses. We want them to be well rounded, okay? All right. That's my neighbor, Lily. Hey, interesting with this guy. Great hobby, racing those little cars. Every week, for some reason, his back tires pop. He never wins a race. He comes home and polishes the fender six hours a day. Is that ever going to help him win a race? <laughs> no. Same thing with your kids that lose the moon ball pushers. If your kids are losing the moon ball pushers, practice how to beat moon ball pushers. Don't just go out and have them just rally back and forth to each other. So that, that's, I know it's goofy, but I use the saying all the time, but it's not a game of catch, it's a game of keep away. If you train them to play keep away, they're going to have a room for the trophies. I like how you got that. I'm on it now. <laughs> you see how quick you do that? See, football season's over. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I'll give you a weird uh, analogy. A 10-year-old girl gave this to me about a month ago. Between point rituals, she goes, oh, it's kind of like when a, we're in California. It's kind of like when a dolphin has to swim 300 miles. They have to come up, get air. They go under, they get air, they go under, they get air, and they can go 300 miles without stopping. But when they go under, and they don't take a breath of air, they die. She goes, oh, I get it, that's why I gotta do it in tennis. It takes a 10 year old to teach us why we need, <laughs> but I guarantee you when you see kids that don't do between point rituals, they crash and burn midway through the second set. They're great first set, fall apart in the second, because they're not doing their rituals, they're not they're not focusing and then relaxing, and focusing then relaxing. They forget to relax, and now they run out of air, like the, like the dolphin. Okay. We talked about this a little bit, but try to make sure your players that are pretty serious have more than one style. Even high school players. It's amazing, but you could take two girls, and this is a hard-hitting baseliner, and this is a hard-hitting baseliner. And every year in high school, this girl wins. She's a little bit better at playing against hard-hitting baseliners. She wins every year, every match that they play. Now, this girl all of a sudden develops plan B, how to be a great high and heavy counter puncher retriever, little moon ball action. Now, all of a sudden, this girl wins the next 10 matches in a row against this girl because this girl can't play against moon ball pushers. You get it? So you got to really make sure that your kids have more than one style. And parents need to know that, too. How many, of you, how many of you get this, that even though we're titling this tennis parent education, it's really designed to help us as coaches too? And then we have to help the parents, obviously, but it's, it's a triangle. It's, it's like this. See the little circle? Can you guys get this? These are like three little bodies. Parent, player, coach, little circle. Get that. My daughter made that little thing up. Well, I'm not sure if I love it, but... I had to do it, my wife wouldn't feed me <laughs> if I didn't use her logo. <laughs> All right. We know that you want your players just to be excellent, not perfect. They don't need to be perfect. They're not going to be perfect. Even if they're perfect in practice, when the ball's fed right to them, under stress, things are going to change. And how many times have you seen this? You have a, your young assistant pro. On Friday, they feed balls right to the junior player, right to him perfectly. The junior player goes, man, I'm going to be on tour. Forget this stupid junior tournament. I'm going to be on the tour. The very next day, Saturday comes along. They play a push of retriever. The ball comes high and deep. It's all up here. Now the kid goes down in flames. And the parents call, and they go, we don't get it. Our little Johnny is so good in practice, and they stink in a match. But it's because the coach isn't teaching the game in the manner it's expected to be played. The coach is feeding balls right too, too much. So, you know, very strike zones, things like that. All right, 18? Periodization. Does everybody know this term already? Yeah, old school. Um, 
From the parent side, though, to remind them, I've seen this just recently, um, don't buy a brand new outfit for the, for the gal to wear the day of the match if she's never worn it before. That's important. Um, don't have them try new strings, right, or new, new grips type of thing. And then my favorite was don't, this is my fault, but don't take them to the all-you-can-eat Indian buffet <laughs> in between matches. It's not pretty. All right, last couple for the blenders. Consistent skills training is great if you're going to teach gymnastics or figure skating. They don't create anything in a, in a, in a competitive environment. They only recreate their program. Tennis players are really polar opposite. We've got to use flexible skills if you want to maximize potential. So a good example, quick. Instead of having your group and go, okay, we're going to do forehand approach, forehand volley, backhand volley, overhand. That's consistent skills in the exact order every time. It doesn't happen like that in the match. Try to say things like, I'm going to give you an approach shot, or maybe even a swing volley approach. Come in, you'll get a couple volleys, and overhead I won't tell you where, and keep everything flexible. It's really big because the kids have to think fast, not just have fast feet. Okay? All right. <coughs> most players, most juniors, when they go to play practice sets, they chat for 20 minutes, they play one set, they go home. Try to ask them to play three sets. Maybe start at 2-2, and you'll get to the money part of the set quicker. Or start every game at 30 all, that's fine too. But have them close out three sets, because the secret is how good, how good are they at closing sets. We'd rather have them close three practice than play one full, you know, and be a one set wonder. Okay, that's the blunders. We only have one more little thing to do, and we're, we're good. We're going to talk about match day preparation. Is that okay? We'll cover that a little bit for parents and, and coaches. If you're there, it's great, but I know we're not there. If we're not there, we have to teach the parents what to do, what not to do. Does everybody get that when we, when we coach, we look for um, anomalies? What we're looking for when we coach is we're looking for things that are there that shouldn't be there, like a forehand backswing. But we're opposite. We're looking, what we're looking for, like a detective, we're looking for things that are there that shouldn't be there. That's all we're doing as coaches. Um, okay, let's go through this thing about positive self-hypnosis. Does anybody know this uh, gal and mom? Yeah, Anna, right? And her mom's name is Dragana. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> but, but... What message is she sending in, in for the pre-match? She's calm, she's relaxed, she's confident, she's chilled. This is, what an awesome tennis parent. You don't need to even hear a word just by looking at her body language. Her daughter is relaxed and chilled because the parent is. Now, the next slide I'm going to introduce you to a family uh, that I know that live in San Francisco, but they come down and do some workshops with me. And they're called the Kalowskis. So I'm going to show you the Kalowskis. This is Martha. This is Martha's pre-match. So she wakes up tiny round. She doesn't like Kelly's choice of outfit. She's upset about her chewing. She's screaming about the poor directions. She's annoyed about catching every red light. So guess who goes down in flames because she's so crazy nervous? Poor Kelly. And Kelly gets all the blame, of course, right? Um, as they came down, though, the phone call really was like this. My daughter is 13. She beats all the 16-year-olds at the academy. She's great in practice. But whenever she plays a match, she falls apart. She can't compete. We don't know why. And so anyway, we did this, and this is, it's the parents, really. But. Okay, so the next day comes along. Back to Mark takes her to the, to the match. Here's Mark's pre-match prep talk. Okay, she's ranked 98 spots ahead of us. Your skyrocket will, uh, will, will rise to top 20 if you don't blow it. Remember, she cheats, so get a focus. This is the most important match of the year. Remember, we spent two grand, so don't expect me to keep on forking over my money if you lose again. So, of course, Kelly loses the next round again. So, but be, but be careful, because pre-match sabotage, if you don't know what the parents are saying, you could be like God as a coach. But if they're taking them to a tournament, 
They can blow it for you. The parents can blow it. So. You see, some of those kids almost become numb over the years. And they don't hear that anymore. It's almost like a quiet, kind of difficult between a quiet place on the tennis court. But, but now their mom and dad can't get out of it. Like self-medicating, they're gonna like just learn how to shut it out. Yeah. So I guess when a player shared with you that all this happened, someone's like, "Well, that's why we have tenses." <laughs> that's your quiet choice. Yeah. Good point. Sorry. If you change the name to protect the innocent, or yeah, if these guys, yeah, well, how do you get, how do you approach them to clean we, it up? Well, we actually did. We we sat down. We had we had some sessions regarding it, and. We have them use your their iPhone digital recorder, and they have, they have to record their their pre-match routines and rituals, and so we can listen to the parents. Mm -hmm. so, sometimes when I have them do that, it's weird. The parents do say five positives for every one negative, but the kid only hears the negative. So sometimes it's opposite. The the kid only hears they can isolate. So we know that stress increases muscle contractions and. Decreases fluid movement. So it is their job to de stress. And so that's really important that we kind of encourage that, that de stressing. Um, let's go through, we'll go through the next couple of slides of what maybe they should be doing. The tennis parent pre match job descriptions. This is important, discussing the start of the play. I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, at the Easter Bowl a couple years ago, I had a player who was not running super high, but maybe top 30-ish. And sadly for her, she had to play the number two girl in the nation first round of the tournament. So bad draw. <coughs> so we're warming up, and we're, we're not really even talking about the opponent at all. We're just trying to get her comfortable with her own, you know, like top sevens, right? The dad pulls into the club, the Riviera Country Club, Palm Springs. He drove from California. The dad opens the door, comes to the court, he goes, this is rigged. This is the worst draw ever. I can't believe she's playing the number one player first round. Who made this draw? Who do I have to complain to? And so, of course, right when little Sarah heard that, she kind of fell apart a little bit. She went down in flames. Turns out later on that day, the number two girl in the nation loses. Next morning, back draw. Guess who Sarah has to play first <laughs> round back draw? Number two. Luckily, the dad was so pissed, he went home. He goes, I'm not staying for <laughs> stupid backdrop. He's out of there. So we're, all we do is we go, look, Sarah, you're playing the girl in the yellow shorts. She has no backhand. Should be pretty routine. Her short ball option is drop shot. So if you hit short and you see this high to low, go. Get in there. They're gonna, she's going to drop a lot. So Sarah ends up beating the number two girl in the nation. Her friends run up and start hugging her. You just beat the number two girl in the nation. She goes, she goes I did win. You did right now. She goes, I did not. And she didn't believe it, that the girl number two was so bad. She goes, that girl was so bad, she couldn't have been number two. But you can see how parents can kind of blow it. Really sabotage. All right, so let's go to the next one. Max time. Remember I talked about video analysis? Try to encourage your parents to get, pick up this, this tool. I don't, I've never met this guy out of Denver. It's called MyTennisTools.com. And he sells this telescopic pole, and there's a little digital camera. You hook up to the back of the back fence, and it's a wide-angle lens. It works great. Um, GoPros are great, too. But what I encourage, go ahead. I can tell you how to make one for 15 bucks instead of paying him All right. <laughs> make sure you guys all hit him up later for the $15 pole. It's huge. It's so important. Back in my day, especially with all the Vic Braden college stuff we did, we always had the video camera behind the player, and we had them do static videotaping. We stood still and do pri you know, primary strokes. But nowadays, I think you guys should have the parent videotape a match, and they have to come to you one hour a week, and you sit down inside and do a video analysis session. You need to teach the child why they lose before they can learn how to win. And so instead of just fundamental strokes, you can teach them all these issues. Are they doing between four rituals? How's their concentration? Their emotional control? Movement spacing? Are they reading the other girls' patterns? And there's so much to be gained if you can have the parents do that. So everybody wins. You, you win. Your players win. The parents win. All right, last few. Post-match.
I think reminding your parents of this is still it's amazing to me, but what place did you win with did you hit your performance goals? Did you have fun? That kind of thing. If the first thing the child ever hears is, did you win, are they going to be outcome oriented or performance oriented? Yes. Inadvertently, if you don't plan ahead and plan how you're going to say these words to your student when they come back from the tournament that you didn't go, it's a great. It's really difficult. Yeah, you're right on. It's what I'm talking about. Is we have to preset protocols. For coaches, we have to preset our protocol. What are we going to say after a match? What's our script? How are they going to handle cheaters? What's their protocol? Handle cheaters. <laughs> There's presetting protocols to everything, not just how to hit a topspin backhand. And but you're right, we've got to preset our protocols too. I think the biggest thing, I, I, I'm a high school coach, I'm not at a club, so the, the biggest thing that I ask my kids when they come off the court is, did you give it everything you had today? Great one. I mean, because effort, right? Everybody's not 100% every day. But yeah. Did you give it all you had yeah. the way you felt today. And yeah. if they can honestly quickly say, yes, if they have to think about it, I know that they're, mm -hmm. they're telling me what I want to hear and not what is actually going on. Yeah, yeah. We've seen kids respond to the question of, um, did you do your strategy or did you do your, and their answer is, oh, but I won two matches and I, they don't even answer the question because they're so used to answering the did you win or lose or how many matches yeah. did you win or lose. Yeah, you're right on. And it, it is a culture we we're trying to kind of change a little bit, but so is tennis parent, I mean, parent education didn't happen when we were kids. It was just like, here's your baseball mitt, here's your basketball, here's your racket, go and go win. There's no information. But nowadays around the world, every kid is training with sports science efficiency. It's serious business everywhere. So if, you're, if your parents are hobbyists, hobbyist parents, they shouldn't expect anything but hobbyist results. That's one of my pet peeves. I get a parent that's a hobbyist. They're like, look, I'm going to go to Nordstrom's. I'll be back in five hours. And then, but they want their kid to win every tournament. So it's kind of it's kind of weird, but I remember um, Chris Everett played in Charlotte this year. I think it's fifteen. And she beat Margaret Court uh, the first time she beat. and uh, she called her dad. And Jimmy, first thing he asked her was how she played. So he already was ahead of the game, huh? He was not even, and that's made a big thing to me. I whenever people finish matches, I just try to encourage people so we can talk about it for a while. How does that affect the harmony of the long term harmony of the family? What do you think? If you're saying you're saying things like effort, like you're mentioning, right? How was your effort? Did you hit your performance goal? Did you hit the shot the moment demands? Did you go f execute the right things out there? Yeah. That's I'd huge. Just rather, I'd just rather parents didn't even talk to them about it. Yeah. Maybe well not, especially if they're uneducated, right? If they're uneducated. But you got to remember this, that with 160 hours a week, you, if you're at best, you have 20 hours with a kid. The parent has 140. So 160 hours, 24 hours a day times seven. Parent has them 160, you have them for 20. If the parent is not educated, your 20 hours is not really going to do everything that needs to be done. You're not going to maximize at the fastest rate, for sure. So Anyway, then we'll do the last couple and we'll... Oh, I think we're done. Um, I taught both of these kids growing up, and they, they definitely had parents with plans. An interesting thing about Vanya King was she had Philip, Yvonne, and Mindy, and then she was the fourth. The top three were all supposed to be pros on the tour. And the dad, the parents did everything they could to make them all pros on the tour, and finally the last one did, did make it. But I remember Mindy saying she didn't have it, she wasn't competitive enough, so the parents at age 15 made Mindy do all the laundry and cook dinner for everybody. Because if she wasn't going to be a pro, she has a job to do for the family. So that family was serious about it. And, and Mike and Chris Query, they moved from Las Vegas to California because tennis. They wanted better tennis for their kid. So, all right, is there anything else on that thing? No? Yeah. That's good. We can stop right there. I think that's it, right? Yeah, I think that's it. All right, so. Oh. No. oh what time do we have? We're okay. We're okay? Yeah, we got about All right, you guys want to do one? Let's do this quick. I'm going to kind of just list these last couple of slides why it benefits you to educate parents. Okay, we'll do the last couple of slides quick. 
Uneducated parents will shift alliance from academy to academy, coach to coach. And we talked about it already, but unsatisfied, uneducated parents can hurt your program for years to come. But that's powerful. Okay, number two is team synergy, family harmony. Parents need to feel like they're involved. They want to be involved. It's their children. Um, interestingly, when a couple years ago I started working with Tennis Israel, and their national tennis program, the Israel Tennis Centers, didn't allow parents to get out of the car. We started doing these, I feel really bad, but we started doing these two years ago, and I just heard last year, they fired all their head coaches, they have all new head coaches, and they're doing tennis parent education now. So they're, they're realizing that kicking the parent to the curb is probably not in their best interest. So, uh, next one. Educated parents, they understand their job descriptions. And they do have jobs, but if they don't know what their jobs are, they're going to be doing your job. They're going to be coaching their kids. We don't want them coaching. We want them to be doing things like scheduling and traveling, off-court, equipment preparation, proper nutrition. And that's one of the things that my books kind of focus on is here's the parental jobs. If they're doing their jobs right and you're doing your job right, that kid is going to be amazing. But they have to know what their jobs are. Well, you see this, how they, what, a, a parent that's not involved in your program, when the kid loses, the kid's not to blame. It's, it's you. They go, we need a better coach. This, this coach is an idiot. We need a new guy. So they're going to dump the coach if they're not involved. OK, last one. They understand the finances of raising athletic royalty. And remember, tennis is a beautiful sport for everybody. You can be a hobbyist and play for free at the park and recs. But if you want to be competitive, there's a financial burden, right? And it's not just tennis, it's every sport. If you look at things like equestrian, motocross, it's way more expensive than tennis. If you look at gymnastics or figure skating, more expensive than tennis. And even nowadays, there's, you can be ranked in paintball, and that's about $50,000 a year. If you want to send your kid around the country to be the number one paintball dude. <laughs> That's crazy, right? All right. Cool. Let's, let's unwind. I know you guys probably are into the chatting mood, but I'm going to hang out for a while. So if you have any questions, come grab me. But let's, let's give two minutes for two, two or three questions. You, you mentioned the email. You, is yes. your email in here, or can we get that from? Yes, you? it's on the back, but also. Brochures. Yep, it's on that. It's on this black and white or black and gold thing like this. Okay. That was my question. Yep, but I'll give it to you too if you can't find it. Okay. FGSA at Earthlink .net. So That's in the, Frank. It's on the back page. Yep. It's on the last page of this. I think it's in the back of that one too. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. You got it. Great. Thanks. If not, just. Email side. <laughs> All right, anything else? You guys go, go for it. Uh, when you're working with younger and younger players, since they're both physically, mentally, and emotionally, not where they're going to be when they grow up, is there any way you would alter some of this? Probably all of it. Yeah, I would, I would definitely customize everything you do to the kid. And interesting thing, too, is I've never had. A parent or a kid say, look, just make me average. I only want to be average. They never say that. They, even though the parent might say, I want my kid just to play high school, as soon as the kid gets into it, gets the bug, and then they get the love for the game, they change. Now this kid that only wanted to be high school, now that, yeah, I think I want to play some tournaments. And, so they'll, 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 they'll change their whole goals, right? Especially if we're doing our jobs right. All right, what, anything back here, you guys? All right. We're going to break. What's up next for the lunch? Lunch. Yeah, we're going to lunch. We're going to lunch. All right, let's go. Yeah. Okay, one more. Yeah. Do you have any strong opinions about the number of tournaments that kids play? Like, there seem to be kids that are 11, 12 years old who are not national level. They seem to be chasing points in their section or their state. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're playing a tournament every other weekend, and they're, but they're really just still working on their game. Yeah. And trying to play a lot. The parents think, well, oh, I keep, you know, my ranking keeps going up. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's and, good. And better growth. Yeah. That's what they're looking for. Chasing the draw. Chasing the draw. Points. It's all they can do. Every other weekend, 
having the same number of points as somebody who's playing every other month because they're really working on their game. Yeah. Those two outcomes are going to be much and, different. And I would ask, first thing I would ask the parent is, what are your goals? If they want to be the top ranked kid in the tens, I'd say be a moonball pusher and play every week. But if they want to play college, I'd say play maybe one or two tournaments a month and spend more time being an athlete. De developing athleticism, to me, and you guys probably know this too, teaching people how to hit a stroke is easy. But you need a great athlete. So it takes years to be a great athlete. So I think up until 12 or so, keep them in soccer, basketball, any flexible skills type of thing. If the kid is more fine motor skill dominant, have them do yoga to work on the gross motor skill parts a little bit. But uh, I like the idea of maybe one or two tournaments for the players I work with. That seems to be the average. So you got to look at you got to look at how many rounds they, they're winning there too. Are they getting to the finals every week and they're playing five matches, or do they lose first round and then they get one match? That will determine, right? All right, come grab me if you have any other questions, or email me. Or if anybody, does anybody have a private jet that could fly me back to California <laughs> in about 15 minutes? I, yeah, it's pulling up outside. I gotta yeah, get. You know, you just gotta walk outside. <laughs> uh, I'm never gonna get home. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.